it started in Cuba. The US Embassy in Havana is a brutalist seven-story edifice of concrete and glass. Ringed by rusty security fences, it squats like a tombstone on the edge of Havana Bay. For the backdrop to a spy thriller, it certainly looks the part. At the end of 2016, something weird started to happen to people working here. It was the beginning of something, something seemingly inexplicable, something that snowballed into a huge, global, history-changing event. Something that destroyed lives and crippled a nation. And it started with a sound. There's an Old Testament story, the Battle of Jericho. The Israelites besieging an impregnable fortress city are commanded by God to blast the walls with mighty trumpets. Our relationship with sound is both oral and physical. Think of the inception wow, that skips the ears and cuts right through to our hindbrain. The deep, enveloping, thumping bass at a club or concert. A sound wave is a moving wall of compressed air. You don't just hear it, you feel it in your whole body. That's what makes it intoxicating. It envelops you, shakes you. You vibrate with the music, become one with it. But it can also be destructive. An explosion is the same wall of air as thumping bass, but much stronger. A powerful enough sound wave is a shock wave. A powerful enough shock wave destroys everything in its path. That's the duality of sound. It can create beauty or pandemonium. There is no actual historical evidence for the Battle of Jericho. It's a story, but one that sticks in the mind because it's such a potent evocation of that duality. Of sound as a weapon. From Project Brazen and PRX, this is The Sound, an investigative podcast. I'm Nikki Wolf. This is Chapter One, Jericho. Good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. So glad you joined us this evening for The Sound, The Mystery of Havana Syndrome. And this program is done in conjunction with the investigative podcast series by the same name from Project Brazen, PRX, and Goat Rodeo. The sound is dropping now. I myself am all caught up with um, episode five. There are more episodes coming. And our program tonight, uh, some recordings will probably be included in the series in the future. To tell you a little bit more about the series, I will briefly turn this over to producer Max Johnson. Uh, first off, thank you all for coming tonight, for, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure to meet yet. My name is Max Johnston, I'm a journalist and co-creator of The Sound, uh, the podcast that brings us all here today. First off, there's a lot of people to thank for making this show and this event possible. Uh, there's my co-workers at Go Rodeo, which uh, is a strange name for a podcast company. But uh, it's an extremely talented group of audio storytellers who work tirelessly to bring the show to life. So I want to thank all my colleagues um, at Go Rodeo. We do always have an ear out for stories, ideas, and new places to take this medium. So hearing this work sparks ideas we do want to hear from you. I'd also like to thank our partners at Project Brazen. Uh, they're an extraordinarily talented group of storytellers and producers based out of the UK. And the Brazen team is doing unique work in this space, and our partnership with them, uh, we believe, represents the best of what podcasting can accomplish. 
I'd also like to thank the Spine Museum. Uh, the museum is a tremendous resource for those who want to understand the world of espionage and its impact on our everyday lives. And everyone I've, I've met here and worked with has been thoughtful and professional, and I look forward to more opportunities uh, to work with them in the future. I wanted to talk for a moment about this podcast, The Sound. Uh, the show is an eight-part investigative podcast that's available wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, the show unwinds the mystery of what some people call Havana Syndrome, others call anomalous health incidents. Um, I came into the story for all the obvious reasons, the mystery and intrigue surrounding it. I was excited to wade into a world of classified intelligence, secret weapons programs, and Cold War geopolitics. But as I and my colleague Mickey Wolf got deeper into it, we realized the story was actually about much simpler ideas. It was a story about service. Uh, government employees doing thankless work around the world in service of their country. It was a story about silent injury, about people experiencing something lifelong and debilitating while serving their country. It's a story about their fight, their fight to get clarity, control, and answers for what happened to them. It's a story about chaos, about the gears of bureaucracy and the people that get caught in the middle of it. And it's a story about secrets, about the things that we keep from each other and the impact that keeping those secrets inevitably has on all of us. It's a story that's more than any one person, one government, one agency. It's about all the people who spoke to us for the show. Several of you are in the audience tonight. People with the courage and vulnerability to share something that they don't quite understand, and the strength to put themselves on tape and tell their story. These are people searching for meaning where questions are endless and answers are evasive. And my hope is that our podcast and the conversation that you're gonna hear tonight We'll get them just a little bit closer to finding those answers and finding that clarity. I want to thank everyone once again for supporting the show and this very important work. And with that, I want to turn it back over to Amanda, who will handle the people. So thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you so much, Max. Tonight, our panel will be moderated by Dr. Andrew Hammond. Andrew is our historian and curator, and he is the host of our very own podcast, the very popular SpyCast. I'm going to let the gentlemen have a chat first, and then we will open the floor to your questions. So thanks, everyone. Over to you, fabulous people. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight to explore this issue uh, and I feel like uh, a Scotsman, an Englishman and two New Yorkers, I feel like there's a joke in there somewhere so <laughs> I'll leave it to you to workshop in the uh, reception afterwards. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to discuss this issue in a second but I just wanted to put a little bit of historical context around this, uh, given that's what the Spy Museum pay me for. Um, so just, just to put it in context, so for some people, this seems really far-fetched, right? Microwave beams. It seems like the death ray scare of the 1920s, H.G. Wells, there were all of these fantastical things that were going to happen. Let me just give you a few things that have been verified. So. The period 1945 to 1962, the thing, which is a, the great seal of the United States, was given to Avril Harriman, the American ambassador in Moscow, and there was a passive cavity resonator in there, which basically means that it would only be activated when electromagnetic beams were directed towards it. This was there for seven years until 1952, this was there, it got discovered during the uh, tenure of George Kennan, who actually th on this particular day wrote the long telegram. So someone who was foundational for American Cold War for foreign policy. Uh, and actually one of the ambassadors during this time was also a former director of central intelligence, uh, Walter Beadle Smith. Then, so that's 1945 to 1952. 1953 to 1977, a thing called the Moscow Signal. So let me just, uh, I'll, I'll illustrate this by speaking about some Senate hearings that were held in 1979. So just listen to the title of this. Microwave irradiation of the US Embassy in Moscow 
So this is the name of a congressional report. Let me quote from it, the opening passage. People reading this report may know that the US Embassy in Moscow was subjected over a period of approximately 25 years to microwave radiation, close quotes. Henry Kissinger, in a call with Anatoly Dobrynin, the long-term uh, Soviet ambassador in, in Washington, DC, this is a recently, or not, not too long ago, classif declassified file. Kissinger to Anatoly Dobrynin, that beam that you're beaming into our embassy in Moscow, maybe you could turn it off. We really are sitting on it here, but too many people know about it. We will catch hell unless we can say something is happening." Close quotes. This brings us up to the person I want to start with, uh, Mark. So Mark Polymeropoulos, uh, I'm going to let him tell his own story, but he's in Moscow, the same place that we've just been speaking about, going back to 1945, in 2017, uh, when he experiences what he went through. So I'd like to start with Mark, and then from this case, Mark, a very human uh, experience, we'll go over to Nikki and broaden it out and find out what Nikki found, uh, some of the hypotheses, the evidence that you found and so forth. But I think that, you know, ultimately this is a story of uh, human pain and human fortitude, and I think we've got a great example of that here on the stage. So if you don't mind uh, just telling the audience your story, how, it, how this all happened for you, please, Mark. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So I think, you know, to, to start, this is probably the last place, although I, I have a lot of friends and, and colleagues in the audience, the last place I really want to be talking about myself and my, and my health struggle. Um, you know, as I have gone kind of public uh, uh, with, with what happened to me, almost as a plea for help, because it eventually did get me to Walter Reed's um, Traumatic Brain Injury Center. But um, this is not something that's normal for someone like myself who spent 26 years uh, at CIA and the clandestine services. Um, you know, we live in the shadows, that's where we're supposed to operate. And so the notion that, that, first of all, I went public with it, but also that I'm sitting here talking about it is odd, to say the least. And it also has, it kind of certainly opens you up, um, your whole personal life and the struggles, both mental and physical health struggles. But the story is, is and, I've, and I've said this many times, I'm happy to, of course, say it again for the audience. In December of 2017, I was the uh, Deputy Chief of Operations for the Europe and Eurasia Mission Center. So um, I, was in, I was the deputy in charge of clandestine operations across 50 countries, um, uh, across the European continent, and all the way to the farthest time zones of, of, uh, uh, of Russia. Now, I had been a long time Near East Division case officer, um, also worked in the Counterterrorism Center, and I was brought in this job specifically after the 2016 elections and Russian interference, um, not making a political statement, uh, but, but ultimately they wanted to bring a whole bunch of us from, from the Near East and the counterterrorism world to kind of take it back towards the Russians. And so what I had to do was go to Moscow for what we call area familiarization, which in essence is visiting the embassy, um, seeing the ambassador there, it was John Huntsman, who was a senior statesman, um, a, a superb ambassador, but I had to go get eyes on the ground there for a lot of reasons, I had to see what I was you know, what I was in charge of, but also for, you know, credibility as well. I had to, I had to go kind of take, take a trip there. So it was a 10-day trip. Uh, I believe it was on December 5th. Um, I woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't hear a sound. And, you know, everyone's story is different. Um, I did not hear a sound per se, but I woke up with an incredible case of vertigo. Um, the room was spinning. Uh, uh, I, was, I felt physically sick. I had tinnitus, which is ringing in my ears, and it was, it was pretty terrifying. And, and I say this after someone who'd spent almost three years in the war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and been shot at more times than I had um, uh, cared to talk about. I ran a paramilitary base along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. We were in combat every day. This was the most terrifying experience of my life because I had lost total control. Something had happened. Um, and it was the vertigo, the extreme vertigo, which is nothing like I'd ever experienced before. Uh, the next morning I woke up, um, I, you know, I had contact at the embassy, we went to a local pharmacy to get some anti-nausea medication. Um, I, when that, we then went to St. Petersburg along with our, you know, all of our trailing surveillance, which is totally normal. There's some Moscow veterans here, so they'll know all about that, nothing unusual. Uh, uh, I felt a little bit better and then I returned to Moscow the night after and it hit me again as I was sitting having dinner in the Pushkin Cafe, a famous restaurant in Moscow, when extreme vertigo hit me again and, and then I kind of, you know, kind of 
uh, try to survive the rest of the trip, crawled my way back onto the, to, to the airplane and came home and it started a, a pretty awful medical journey um, and, and really fights with the CIA's Office of Medical Services where when I came home, I asked to be seen and treated and, and the answer from them um, was nothing's wrong with you. Uh, uh, it, this caused me to eventually retire um, after a, you know, a, a medical journey, which again took me to my own private doctors, spent thousands of dollars of my own money, and the Office of Medical Services, despite my repeated pleas, um, refused to, to give me treatment. I, of course, at that time had thought about what had happened to my colleagues in Cuba. Um, I had begged to go to the University of Pennsylvania, which a lot of people know is where, where some of our officers from Cuba were being treated, and they said no. Um, I finally retired in July of 2019, and at that time, some of my other colleagues were affected, and they were going to Walter Reed's uh, uh, Traumatic Brain Injury Center. It's called NICO. And even then, through my contacts at the agency, I was begging for medical care. It had gotten so bad, I couldn't drive. I lost my long-distance vision. Um, I had terrible brain fog. Uh, and at, when, I finally made, when I finally made the decision to go public, it was via uh, uh, an, uh, a journalist, Julia Yaffe. She's, she's ill. She couldn't be here tonight. But, I credit so much to her because she wrote an article about me in, in GQ magazine. Um, the day it was published, uh, uh, three former CI directors um, called me, who I knew from my time. I retired from the senior intelligence service, so I was relatively senior. And they said, what the hell is going on? Uh, why haven't they treated you? This is a tremendous leadership fail on the part of the agency, which is correct. Because ultimately, as you know, with my 26 years at the agency and as a Near East officer, I think I was involved in every covert action program in the Middle East. Um, always with the notion that whatever, uh, you know, what, they, what the U.S. government was asking me to do, and there were some unusual things, Andrew and I, you have kind of, you and I have talked about this, but I always thought they would have my back, and they didn't. And even when I was, again, when I was retired, I was begging to get medical care, and the, the answer repeatedly was no. And so I finally went public, and three agency directors, former directors called me, they immediately called the seventh floor, and miraculously the next day I was admitted, um, or given authorization to go to, to the Walter Reed uh, uh, program. And you know, I could go on and on about this, but I will say that the 18, 18 specialists there, the doctors and nurses, saved me. Um, pretty, pretty tough time. I was not in good shape when I got there, and I, I came out of there with, with some hope and some tools, um, and I'm still on the kind of long road to recovery, and I'm feeling much better. Um, that was five years ago, if you can imagine that now. Sorry, I get, a, I get emotional even talking about it, but what those doctors did for me, um, I will never be able to repay them. The, the, your career was taken away from you, your physical health, your mental health, I mean, really debilitating, right? I was, you know, again, the position I had, and when I left, I remember that the deputy director of operations at the time asked me, are you okay enough? We want to bring you upsta upstairs to be one of the associate deputy, the ADDOs. This is the pinnacle of someone's career at the CIA. I couldn't even go to work for three hours. I had such bad headaches, um, and, 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 and it was brain fog, and it just, I was, I was a mess. And so I went from someone who was a, you know, a high performer, uh, uh, but also someone who, and even in my journey now, as I've talked about this publicly, I deeply believe in the mission of the CIA. And so you know, it's an indispensable institution for the United States, and I'm very proud of the things we did and, the, and, the, and, and, and you know, work with, with my colleagues, who I think are heroes. Um, but, the, but not only, the, the, there's a moral injury to this. There's a betrayal I felt when the CIA didn't give me um, the medical attention that I needed, and it, it just, again, it, it's simply, you know, if you're not feeling well, and an employee comes to you, send them to the doctor, and they weren't able to, to do that, and to me, that's just a, a leadership fail for the ages, and something that, to, you know, to, to current CIA Director Bill Burns' credit, um, uh, uh, when he, you know, came into, into office, he called me, and I, I've spent many hours with him, and, um, and he fundamentally didn't understand uh, some of the decisions that were made. Uh, you know, at the, with the previous administration. This is not a political thing. This is just a kind of basic leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think there's a number of things that I would like to come back to there. Um, and just for those of you that don't know Mark, which is probably a minority, uh, as he said, 26 years in the CIA, uh, one of the most highly decorated officers of his generation. Um, going on to Nikki before we get to the other mark, and Nikki has worked at The Guardian, The New Statesman, uh, done all kinds of things, uh, and he's such a great narrator. If anybody's listened to the episodes, uh, I really loved hearing your voice. Thank you. I guess I'm going to start by uh, Mark's prompting, completely fact-checking my own opening monologue. <laughs> uh, but I guess if I, should I go back to the beginning and give kind of a brief overview mm -hmm. of what, so, um, 
in 2016, at the end of 2016, um, the first of what would be 24 of the first cohort and of it started out as CIA officers and later diplomats in the US Embassy in Havana started reporting these weird medical symptoms. And those included quite a lot of what uh, Mark's just talked about experiencing. So we're talking vertigo, uh, insomnia, nausea, brain fog, also ocular damage. Later it came out brain uh, damage was found on some scans. Now that's um, exactly the definition of damage is, is complicated. Um, but quickly this was run up the chain um, within the CIA, the State Department, and the Pentagon. It was clear something was happening. Um, patients were flown out into at first Miami and then University of Pennsylvania. They were given scans. Um, and when it went public, there were a whole bunch of hypotheses that people ran through really quickly. Now, the first one, as I talk about in the monologue, was the idea that it might be some kind of sonic weapon sound device. Um, that was what uh, then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson um, first said when the, the questions were asked. Actually, of the hypotheses, that one was relatively easy to rule out, um, partly because the level of, of sound, ironically, because a lot of the uh, people had reported hearing a strange sound that accompanied the onset of symptoms, a sonic energy weapon that could cause these symptoms would actually be either past the top end or below the bottom end of what you could hear. So ironically, we ruled out sound as, as the weapon because people could hear something. Um, but then uh, the other two major theories were that either A, there was some kind of psychogenic um, transfer going on, a sort of mass delusion. The power of suggestion is very powerful. It can cause a certain amount of uh, types of symptoms. And then the other theory that, that quickly emerged was a directed energy device, some kind of um, likely microwave energy. Um, and those became the two major theories that we were kind of litigating. Um, and the problem with the psychogenic hypothesis is that, one, a lot of the early cases didn't follow a kind of a network pattern. There were, among the first ones, there was not a huge amount of ability to uh, transfer the idea from one to the other. And also, there were some of the symptoms that are simply not within the realms of what uh, psychogenic illness can cause. So, like, you know, it can cause nausea, but it can't cause detached retinas, it can't cause um, lesions to come up on, on brain scans, that sort of thing. And then the next question we had was, if it is some kind of directed energy device, what's the status of that kind of technology out there? And it became, as we researched it, it became clear to us that actually the, the technological capabilities weren't just, it, it wasn't just plausible, but these were devices that were being, um, that, that existed in the real world and that, uh, American defense companies are even manufacturing. There's patents out there and things like that. So we hit that plausibility um, argument, and then it became a question of motive. So again, the Cubans were accused first off because this was happening in Cuba, and this was in the early days of the Trump administration. There were a lot of people like John Bolton whose agenda it really suited to blame Cuba. They'd wanted to roll back on Obama's opening up for a really long time. They put Cuba back on the state sponsor of terror list. Um, but really, no one serious that we've spoken to believes that the Cubans were really doing this. And obviously, given the kind of geopolitical situation, there's one major suspect that, that quickly emerged, which is Russia, um, which is how we came to Mark. We were talking about what other you know, examples of this were coming up. Um, and yeah, as, as uh, the other thing I said in there was it started in Cuba, which um, also, the more research we did, the more we found examples, as you say, going back to the 50s, of different types of deployment by Russia of directed energy, partially for um, intelligence gathering, and then uh, as, as it kind of progressed, um, it became less and less plausible that they didn't know this was also causing health effects. And just very briefly for our audience, one of the things that I found fascinating was the, 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 the narrative arc and the podcast. You start off more skeptical, mm. but then there's a transition as you encounter more uh, victims, as you see more evidence. So can you just talk about that, that transition that takes place that, that you encountered? 
I, so I was brought in, to sort of lay cards on the table, I was, my previous show was on QAnon, I was brought in almost explicitly as a conspiracy theory reporter, right? Like my, I, I think when this was commissioned, the idea was as a debunking exercise. Um, and first of all, from talking to uh, the victims that we spoke to, first of all, it, it was very clear that something pretty dramatic had happened to, to these people. Like, and in a way that, um, as I was saying before, the psychogenic effect is extremely powerful. But the more of these stories we heard, the less and less it, it felt like this could be sort of the, the more twists we were having to do in order to explain it that way. Um, and then the other thing was finding out about the force capabilities that, that already exist, which I had no idea about. I had no idea these things were, you know, existed. Um, but yeah, we, we really had that. It, it was less of a single turn, it sort of seems like that, in, in the show, but it was sort of a growing, creeping element of doubt that came up the, the more people we spoke to and the more we heard. Mm -hmm. And over to my uh, good friend, uh, Mark Zaid, uh, who's worked in national security law for a very long time, and I think is one of the most fascinating perspectives in all of this because of the people that you represent and the amount of time that you've been doing this. So tell us how you first came across this, Mark, because it's before the, the Havana syndrome, isn't it? Right, so I give Nikki a bunch of crap and, and everyone else when we always hear in the media say, it started in Havana. No, it didn't. Havana, something happened in Havana that brought this to light at a number of people, two things, the vast number of people impacted and who was being impacted, predominantly State Department. Now, I remember first seeing the stories and immediately as I saw a story, I was like, ah, this is... These aren't State Department people, these are CIA people who are being impacted. Uh, and this is some sort of intel thing. And you know, spy versus spy, and at first it, all the media reports were acoustic weapons. I was already working on a microwave perceived case that dates back to 1995 for an NSA client, Michael Beck, and this is all public. Uh, Washington Post did a great profile piece, The Guardian's done a good piece. and. I've already been on it for several years. Uh, I've already been dealing with the NSA who had given me information that they had knowledge of microwave weapons being used by a foreign adversary that could be used to maim or kill a victim without leaving any evidence. Now it was all intelligence reports. It was this memo that they gave me, you could find it online from 2014, October, is very carefully crafted by my colleagues inside the legal office in NSA because they were giving it to me for use in potential proceedings to try and get medical attention for Michael. And then as Havana hit and we started to hear more and more of what was going on, and now I have two dozen clients or so from across the spectrum of, you name the three-letter agency and other agencies who had personnel serving overseas, uh, some whom you wouldn't have suspected to be impacted, uh, you know, doing trade work. Uh, it wouldn't normally be the type of person, though when you would dig down into some of the cases, you'd realize that they were in the same housing that had housed former CIA people that had been based there. And I, I will tell you, we don't know what's going on. I mean, let's Let's be very clear about this. We know the color of the victims, the stories they can tell in their experiences and what they've gone through. But this case, these cases, when you look at them historically, and the Moscow Signal, I'll say, is the ancestor of it, and you have to look at it that it's not necessarily a straight line. It's an evolution of technology, an evolution of uh, adverial serial uh, capabilities from a spy versus spy. Uh, it is something that has developed where we don't necessarily know the intent. Was it designed for surveillance to capture technology? Was it designed to impact the person or was the person's impact collateral damage that the adversary just didn't care about? Uh, clearly that has changed in the last few years because it has become so public versus where it was in the shadows, that now anyone 
whomever, and it could be more than one perpetrator, they're doing it is clearly having an adverse health impact on people. So regardless of what the intent is, there's, there's a duality. And the notion of, right, th this microphone I'm using is clearly for the purpose of beaming out my voice so you can, you can hear me. But if I bop Mark on the head with it, it's pretty heavy and it could be a weapon too. Uh, and so that's where we're kind of looking at the technology. Now, the problem with this case, cases, is it is at its root intelligence. I liken it to, because I do a lot of work on the Titanic, the iceberg. Only one third of it is visual. The two thirds of it is beneath the surface. What sank the Titanic was beneath the surface, not the part that they saw in the crow's nest. In my work, uh, I have had access to classified information about this, can't share it, obviously. Uh, but I will tell you the vast majority of this information as to the capability, uh, the actor, actors, whatever, all of that is in the classified realm. And what I have seen that has really bothered me the most is not that, oh, they know who's doing it. Maybe they do, I don't know. Or they know what's doing it, maybe they do, I don't know. It's what they have been told over a passage of years of victims from within the community, the intelligence community, at various locations, at various times, that they have ignored, absolutely ignored. Ignored in such a way that it's, as far as I'm concerned, purposeful. Uh, if we look at the Moscow signal as an example, that hearing, it had basically three objectives from the government standpoint, the, the legislative standpoint. How long has the executive branch known this was happening? To what extent were they telling anyone it was happening, a la what Kissinger was referencing? And what were the long-term health effects of it happening? And the responses that came out, the answers were, oh, it's been going on for 15, 20 years. We knew it in the executive branch. Uh, we weren't telling our people that it was happening who were based there in Moscow. And we have no idea of the long-term health impact because not enough time has gone by in 1977 or 9, whenever the, the hearing was, because it had only been a few years that some of these people had been impacted. Well, 1979 is now a long time ago. It wouldn't be that difficult for the State Department or the CIA to go back, and I'm not, maybe they've done it, I'm not aware of it, to go back and identify who was based, even if you looked at the leadership in our embassy, and see the extent to which any of those individuals are one, still alive, and if so, what's their health, or are they deceased, and what did they die of? Because those of us who have been working on this know, historically and sadly, currently, a number, particularly within the agency, the CIA, a number of their personnel have been stricken with uh, cancers, rare form of cancers, Parkinson's, leukemia. All of that could be coincident. All of that could be natural for them. But it appears to be statistically, anecdotally, at a level that is greater than the normal percentage in the population. And why is it that that's not being studied? Why is it there's no report on that? The final thing I'll, I'll end in this sort of monologue is when Mark talks about going to Iraq and Afghanistan and fighting on the front lines, they know the risk they're taking when they do that. And it's just them, and they're willing to accept it. When you look at some of the locations where this has happened, some of which are still classified, others of which have leaked out into the media uh, of reports in North, North America, South America, Europe, elsewhere, some of the most beautiful postings for where a case officer would love to go, because it's just a gorgeous city uh, overseas, where they bring their family and they bring their children. And what hasn't been told I'm not sure, it hasn't been in the podcast yet. Maybe it's going to be, um, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm revealing something in the, one of the future podcasts. I don't know, I'm waiting to see what you say now. <laughs> but, but there are, including some of my clients, a lot 
of children, minor children, who have been impacted by whatever this is. And to go to the psychosomatic aspect, mm. you know, how is it that a new, uh, uh, you know, a less than one-year-old would be psychosomatically impacted, or even, quite frankly, a six-year-old uh, who has no idea what's going on in their parents' lives whatsoever, uh, and yet reports the same symptoms, but also, upon examination, is reflecting the same physical, similar physical deficiencies that can't be explained by you know, anything just occurring in the mind. And that's the untold story, and that's really the sad part, because trying to get them medical care, get them compensation, it's one thing when it's a federal government employee, you know, try and do that for spouses uh, and, and minor children who aren't necessarily covered in the system that they're normally accustomed to be. And, and just to wrap that up, um, you know, just thinking about this in terms of, say, you know, Colombo, trying to solve something, trying to get to the bottom of something. We don't, we don't have a weapon. We don't know the intentionality. We don't, we don't know what the MO is. Is it directed attacks against US intelligence personnel? Or is that a byproduct of doing something else at the embassy? Uh, we don't know what's going on there. Um, it's things that are beyond the human sensory experience, right? It's, it's things that are above and beyond what we can hear and what we can see. Uh, and then it involves intelligence agencies, which, you know, your, your point, Mark, secrecy, uh, classified, that's another part of it. And then the final part, which is, you know, I, th I think significant is, this is ultimately about managing nuclear great power rivalry at some level as well, right? There's you know, there's, there, there's very significant geopolitics behind all of this. So I think that's quite fascinating. So just to move back to uh, Mark, I was wondering, could you tell our audience, how does this, g give them some context for the rough and tumble game of espionage? Because this is pretty common, right? Harassment and, you know, your suitcases go missing and, you know, people have broken into your apartment and so forth. It can, especially in Moscow during the Cold War, it can be pretty rough and tumble, but there was, there, yeah, to g give them some context for what's happened to you and some of the things that have happened to other people in the past. So, so Andrew, you know, traditionally in the in the in the you know espionage business, um, you know, there is a gentleman's agreement, um, not always abided by, and certainly the Russians have played very very dirty, uh, particularly if you serve in Moscow. But overall, you know, even with our with some of our, our biggest adversaries, you know, when you serve overseas, uh, and and you have you know a CI case officer, and you know that there's Russian intelligence officers, Iranian intelligence officers, Chinese intelligence officers, you're developing them you're trying to recruit them, or you see how they are having an impact, um, uh, what they're doing on the streets. But ultimately, there is an agreement that you don't hurt each other. Uh, uh, now that, again, it, that's, that's very kind of broad, and it doesn't go to, to some of the tough places like, it, like in Moscow or, or other times where, where our officers have been targeted. But again, it's the general notion of, of that is not violated. Um, and so, so in, in this case, what is happening um, does seem to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, go to the extreme, uh, particularly in the numbers that we're talking to. And this is not numbers what we're, you know, in the, even if we're saying, you, you can't even, you know, quantify the number of attacks that, that have occurred, but, but this is out of the norm. Um, and, and so then, you know, one of the things that I guess we then look to, you know, so if I'm, if I, you know, when I'm, I'm in places where there's a, a threat of counterterrorism, uh, or, or we're going after terrorist groups, sure, they're going to try to hurt CIA officers, but as a Russian, SVR officers, a Chinese MSS officer, or Iranian MYS officer, necessarily going to do something like this? You know, perhaps not. Now, so, so then you go to the notion of why? What's changed? And to me, the way I think about this is, uh, and, and I, I've been very open in when I say that I think Russia is a leading suspect, and I'm, I'm fine debating that all day, but if you take a look at, at how Russia and Russian intelligence is behaving over the last several years in the in, in international stage, well, they are doing things a little bit out of the norm, like trying to, you know, trying to kill their old officers uh, in the UK, um, assassination operations in Germany. Um, they're getting caught doing so. They're being very brazen in this. Um, it's almost a, you know, a reflection of what I think is they're, you know, they're practicing of, of hybrid warfare, which is everything kind of underneath the surface, non, you know, non-kinetic shooting war, but they're doing things 
um, that that are a bit out of the norm. And so, uh, uh, I think that you know that does give us some pause, especially as Mark said, when CIA officers go overseas, not in, in conflict zones, but in traditional assignments, they take their families. And and I know, and you know, and, and Mark alluded to it. I have friends and colleagues who have been affected by this, um, as have their six-month-old. Uh, infants who have a permanent traumatic brain injury. And that to me is far beyond the norm of what, what is you know, part of the intelligence game. Um, something that is way out of line. And, uh, and, and what this then does, uh, and, and I can't, I'm not, I, I retired in mid 2019. I don't know the sentiment inside the agency now. But I will say if uh, uh, I have had, uh, you know, just individual anecdotes of friends who you know, hey, do you want to go serve an XYZ location? Well, I'm not sure I want to take my family there. Um, it is, a, it is a, uh, uh, a barrier to overseas service, which is something that we were very proud of for many years. So I think that's something that um, you know, needs to be explored. And kind of coming full circle, if you look at the reasons why, and if you want to get not conspiratorial, but you know, so people always ask me, why has the agency not really pushed this and investigated it to the, to, um, uh, uh, to the best of, of the ability of a world-class intelligence service, and, and you know, people have different views of this. Well, what if we come to the conclusion that it's not safe to serve overseas? Um, that's something that our operations directorate can't have happen. So I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, uh, you wouldn't want to kind of push this to, the, to, to some conclusions which might be pretty disturbing for, for future service if we can't find out and stop what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a hard thing to say. Someone, again, I volunteered for just about everything as my, my wife is in the audience, as she knows. I was, so there was a conflict that happened, I raised my hand and off I go. Um, uh, you know, that's, a, that's something that I think people might have pause now, and that's, that's damaging to our ability to kind of project, uh, you know, what we need to overseas. And I remember you describing this to me once, uh, and you said that would be one, I think, one hell of a National Security Council meeting if if you know they had conclusive proof and, and everything was on the table about what would the response be. And I just wondered, uh, Nikki, you know, you've, you've been through this personal journey where you encountered highs and lows and, and got to the end. And I was just wondering, what highs and lows did you experience? What was the, what was the you know, you, I see you almost like Ulysses out there getting blown from <laughs> island to island and, you know, eating lotuses and so forth. Uh, yeah. I mean, so one of, the, one of the most staggering things that I found in this was once it was, you know, setting aside the question of what exactly happened for a moment was quite how chaotic because it, coming from not the U.S. and just sort of, you know, you see U.S. kind of intelligence operations as sort of, you know, as the friend who turns up in James Bond or something. And learning that half these agencies barely even speak to each other was gobsmacking. I mean, the, the history of the FBI and the CIA, kind of it's loathing the right word, wouldn't that be just like... But, but like not all playing great together in the sandbox, right? And, and so this idea that something might be happening that... I can't, I can't remember who we spoke to at um, State, but who basically said, I'm looking at Max here in case Max remembers, but who was basically like, yeah, if the CIA know, we'd be the last people they tell, right? Like this, this idea that um, all these agencies kind of have their own agendas and their own, um, not necessarily in a, in a malignant way in, in general, but just not speaking to each other, which just delayed any hope of getting... Uh, a reasonable investigation on this done. Each agency did their own investigation. They came to wildly different conclusions. Um, and so there, there was a point at which all hope of a definitive answer was kind of lost because too much time had passed. The data was getting too noisy. Um, and we spoke to, there was a National Academy of Science investigation commissioned by the State Department, one of you know more than a dozen investigations or so. And um, yeah, they were like, yeah, it took them two years to pick up the phone and call us, by which time it was already too late. And that was, that was the moment where, I just sort of, where we both sort of sat back and were like, damn, there was a real kind of screw up happened here. And then there was the second US government screw up, and uh, Mark, actually you can, you can both speak to this, which is the support for, for the victims just wasn't there from, from any of the branches of government, really. They're, they're just, um, the fight that, that people, 
going through what you went through had to do in order to get the, the bare minimum of, of medical care was really stark to, to me, I thought. And, and was there a particular high point or, you know, was there a coming home to Ithaca to see Penelope moment or...? Well, the, <laughs> the fun part, we, in episode five, we, my old housemate, who's a um, particle physicist, um, we brought him in to build us a test device. Uh, we built a, a microwave energy projection device. And it worked, which was a real... We went out to a field and sort of tested it, and we were picking up, and we'd made a focused beam of, of microwave energy radiation, which sort of demonstrated... Obviously, we weren't kind of scientifically proving anything we were writing this up for, you know, <laughs> any scientific journals. <laughs> but it sort of it felt like it was a moment where we sort of demonstrated, oh, this is this is possible. This is a, a thing that we can knock together out of parts that we've cannibalized from kitchen equipment. Like, if you're Raytheon, like, what kind of, you know, what does that mean for, for where this, this kind of capability might be? And that was, that was very eye-opening. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we tried to cook an egg, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> and uh, one, one question that I wanted to ask all of you, uh, like, what do you see is going on here? Like, is this just good old-fashioned bureaucratic incompetence? Like, what? Like, why have we not got to the bottom of this? Is this people like Kissinger sitting on top of information, or is this just incompetence? Is it lack of communication? Is it something else? Yeah. What's the like? Like, like why would the you know? So you, you, Mark, former senior intelligence officer in the CIA. Why would they not try to help you out? Why would they not try to get to the bottom of it? I know that I have some views on that myself, but I'm sure some people in the audience are wondering the same thing. Like, like what's going on? Like, why, why did it shake out like this? Why did it not shake out in a better outcome? Well, I mean, one of the things that I learned kind of over the, over the years working in national security is, is when there's, when there's a, a story and there's some kind of scandal, incompetence usually is, <laughs> is the... Uh, 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 is the culprit, and in this case, there certainly was some incompetence. But then it starts moving towards um, uh, kind of uh, you know a, 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 a willful, uh, uh, willful neglect, or almost uh, you know almost d uh, dismissive of some of uh, uh, our claims. It didn't make sense to me. I'm not here today, literally, if they had sent me to the University of Pennsylvania when I begged when I came back from Moscow. I was begging to go, and our office of medical services and the staff on the seventh floor. And I was very senior, but they still said no. Our deputy director of operations, the operations side of the house, was fighting with, with kind of more of the, admi the administrative types, but including very senior people at the agency. Um, so, so, you know, at some point, that, that, that incompetence argument goes away, and you're wondering why. Is it liability? Are they worried about, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, lawsuits in the future? Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a question three former CI directors, when they called me, said, why are they not sending you to the doctor? And I said, I can't answer that. And even when I fought to get to Walter Reed for those months and months, um, uh, the, the, the senior, uh, some senior staff at, at the agency and certainly in the Office of Medical Services, who, by the way, CI Director Burns ended up removing um, for cause, um, but they would say things to me like, well, Mark wants workers' compensation. You know, uh, Mark wants money out of this. Um, they started making up things like I had a, a previous traumatic brain injury, a pre-existing condition. So it started going past the incompetence piece to, to, to something a little more, um, frankly, to me, that was, it, was, it was disturbing. It was wrong. Um, and it violated that oath that we had as CI officers to take care of each other. Um, and that, that, that really contributed, again, to that, that moral injury um, that, that I feel. And so it's people actively working against health care. And that, to me, is something that, that I, will, uh, you know, I will never get over. Well, why do you think they were doing that? Was it to protect their own careers, or was it to try to protect the agency in some misguided way? Like, why would, why would people who were your colleagues like, actively work against you? I can't answer that. I, th I know Mark wants to answer. OK, <laughs> OK, right, <laughs> succinctly. This is my lawyer. He's very good. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons. I I always go back to the saying about, you know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And having been in D.C. now for 30 years working on national security cases, never having been in the federal government, at least that I can tell you, um, I haven't. Um, <laughs> That's what you would say. Right. That I, I have determined that 
15 to 20 years is the line where everybody starts forgetting what had happened beforehand. And so I worked on Gulf War syndrome cases back in the 1990s in suing the government for access to data about it, working with some of the congressional task forces on it. I worked on the anthrax vaccine conspiracy matters for a number of years and shut the program down for being experimental. And we saw the same type of machinations within the agencies of challenging the existence of injuries that were difficult to identify. And that's part of the problem. Uh, because you'll have naysayers with inside the agencies who think immediately that people are faking it on purpose because they want to get out of assignments, they want to get free health care, they want to get free compensation, whatever it might be. And, and that grows. And there is a concern, and some of it is legitimate concern because some of the symptoms are so generic uh, and can exist for alternative reasons. Uh, or just are difficult to identify that I've heard from folks within the agencies that you know they they don't want to just be providing uh, lush assignments or compensation to everybody who just applies because they get a doctor somewhere in the United States to say oh you have a traumatic brain injury which frankly you know some doctors will frankly do if for whatever reason um, so there are problems with identifying exactly what this is and quantifying in a way so that the government will take care. But it's, it's all of the above of what everybody's saying. I always say incompetence first, CYA second, malicious conspiracy third. And there could be an overlap between the, the three of them. And we're at a point now, though, where, and the agencies are coming away or coming to it begrudgingly. I used to feel sorry for the State Department in the early years post Havana because they were the poster child and taking the brunt of it because they had the majority of the people publicly. And they were in the dark from the CIA. The CIA was not sharing information uh, with them. I even had that with NSA where CIA, we, had to, we had to bring CIA people up to NSA for them to meet and learn. Uh, same thing with On the Hill as well. And then as time has gone by, Cases have happened where the CIA has had to publicly identify litigation that we have under the Freedom of Information Act, where the CIA was denying, neither confirming nor denying the existence of any records dealing with AHI until we forced them to have to do so. And the same thing with the FBI, because now the FBI has victims of whom I represent. So it, it, it is spreading, and there are a lot. The problem is there's no really easy answer to these questions. But, but I'm just wondering if, like, yeah, sorry to keep pressing, but like, why? Why would they? Why would they do this? Is it? Are they getting pressure from uh, the leadership at the executive level? Like, listen, we can't have a thousand people, uh, you know, getting specific types of treatment or specific types of compensation. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm just pressing because I'm trying to get an answer here. Like, like, what's the reason behind this? Do you have any idea, Nikki? Is it? Is it just one of those things that historians will find out in 50 years when everybody's moved on? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as, as you said, I think there's a lot of ass covering going on. A sort of, oh, uh, we sort of said this to start with. It would really undermine that first position if we now come back and, and start approaching it in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it remains kind of inexplicable to me the way, the, the fight that, that people have had to go through. Well, I mean, it, I like to apply Occam's razor to most everything I do. And I work on a lot of conspiracy cases in, in trying to whittle them down so that they're no longer, frankly, conspiracy cases. Uh, but if you just flesh this out and think of it from the government standpoint of what, if this is what we think it is, what would that mean? And some of it was already mentioned. Litigation. Right? If we've known about this for decades and haven't, we didn't warn our, our people uh, and they've been suffering for uh, health impairment over the years and some have died uh, as a result of that, are they, is the government responsible for it? Um, to what extent we've been doing this to anybody else? Uh, not in a way to harm people, but if it was a harassment, spy versus spy, one possibility. Uh, another. Uh, 
not just litigation liability, but just health care liability, obviously, uh, the notion of going overseas and, and how that would play out. I mean, our thought was when the, when the CIA came out with its interim assessment, uh, which we're suing for also, and they're refusing to give up, about a year or so ago, uh, at least what I was being told internally from my clients, uh, not my clients who are in the CIA, uh, was that people were refusing to go overseas. And, and this was a means by which to tell the workforce, you don't have to worry about it. Because actually, to its credit, the CIA at one point started telling everyone in preparation for going overseas to be on the lookout for these types of incidents and to report everything. And they got flooded with people reporting everything. Uh, and that started to raise a lot of concerns. And then the final real serious consideration to give, if this is again what we think it is, and we've had incidents here in Washington, D.C., including of some of my clients at the White House, if it is an adversary, adversary targeting our people, it's an act of war. And that has really cataclysmic concerns if that's what this is. So if our government knows what it is, I, I could understand actually some reasons I might not agree with it, but I can understand why they wouldn't reveal it. Andrew, let me, let me throw one thing out for, for the audience. I thought this was really telling. So I finally made it to Walter Reed, um, uh, uh, and I was going through my treatment. And I, and I, uh, I went through the one-month program there. Um, and I had kept in touch with, uh, with the, you know, I was retired, but I still kept in touch with, uh, with Director Burns. Um, and of course, uh, uh, I was very close with the Walter Reed staff. I left, and, and I remember Director Burns saying that, you know, he was, they were interested in, in paying a visit to my doctors. And I wasn't there for the time, but both on separate occasions, actually it was uh, CI Director Burns, Deputy Director Cohen, and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, all went to visit my doctors. And, and the Deputy Director of, uh, of the TBI clinic said to them, the delay in, in Mark getting health care several years contributed greatly to his suffering. And, and, and that to me, I was told, had a pretty profound effect um, on, on our national security leadership who heard that. And, and again, that goes back to kind of that, that just that ethical relationship that we had with our, uh, with, that we have with an organization in which um, they have to take care of its people. Yeah, uh, okay, well, this has been really fascinating and I think there's more that's going to come out uh, for the questions. So one of the first ones that I think is quite interesting, have other countries or intelligence services reported similar phenomenon or is this strictly a US, US-centric thing? Canada straight off the bat. So in the, the first, um, the kind of Havana cohort, quite soon after Canadians started to be hit as well, I think there was... 15 or 16 total Canadian cases at the same uh, level, and they did their own separate investigation. They had separate brain scans, which came to the same conclusions that the American institutions doing uh, brain scans had come to. Um, those are the two major targets. We've had um, stories of it, uh, kind of incidental stories happening um, to Australians. No Brits, as far as, as, far as I can I've come across. I've heard anecdotal just, yeah. Brits, but it's all rumor and innuendo. Yeah. It's been more... It, this has always struck me, again, applying Occam's razor that I never understood. Because if it, if it is the Russians as a main protagonist against us, why would they not be doing it to the Germans, the French, the Brits, the, mm. the, the Five Eyes, and others around the world? Not you would to have mention thought, Navalny and... Right. You would have thought this would come up. And... It, it hasn't, uh, other than murmurs of it. Uh, I, I don't know of any press reports of foreign incidents. Uh, so that, uh, you know, that is a perplexing question that is a fair and legitimate one that, to me, always raises strange doubts mm. as to just trying to figure out what the hell this is. I, I mean, this is just a, a thought, but do you think the you know, what, if you think about Britain, the assassinations or the assassination attempts, the Russians have clearly said to themselves, this is something we can get away with with them. Sure, they're in NATO, but, you know, we're taking out our former intelligence, our they, intelligence officers. They don't officers. need to intimidate them. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but, in, in the, you know, you haven't seen those types of things in the United States. 
So are they saying to themselves, let's keep it at the level of non-attributable? Let's do things that are messing with them, but not messing with them because they can never prove it? Or is that, is that, um, is that barking up the wrong tree? Any thoughts? No, I, I think that, that makes a, a lot of sense. Again, the idea of a non-attributable attack um, that, that sows all sorts of chaos. It, you know, if, if this is a Russian, in essence, an active measures plan, um, it's, it's been pretty successful. And then there's also the question of, um, as, as kind of happened to you, which is that, it, um, and we spoke to a lot of people who, until the Havana thing happened, didn't connect the dots between their own experience and, and this. They didn't kind of put the pattern together. Um, it's you know, possible that internal reporting has been done in, in uh, a British context, and it just hasn't hit the press, or you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that could be going on there. Uh, next question. Why is there not more reporting on Department of Def Defense anomalous health, anomalous health incidents? Maybe that's one for you, Nikki. We, one, the DOD, um, we haven't heard directly from any um, DOD employees. We've heard from people indirectly employed by the DOD. Um, it's less valuable, I think, in an active military situation context, which is why it's, it's maybe uh, more people like the, the CIA and state rather than the Pentagon directly. Um, but also, DOD is such a ginormous bureaucratic machine that um, what we heard, even, even compared with you know, CIA and, and state getting answers on this from the Pentagon, uh, I don't know if that sounds fair to you guys, but, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, there have been DOD victims. NSA, of course, I've mentioned. I have several, all from different locations. There's been Defense Intelligence Agency victims. And I know there was at least one DOD victim in Havana at the time. I don't know what position they held, but I know the State Department confirmed it when I was in a meeting. And I will say, I, the Defense Department has been really right now is at the forefront of pushing this to help the victims. There are, and maybe it's lessons they learned from Gulf War Syndrome where they still couldn't figure out exactly what the cause is, but they finally got to the premise of, we recognize you're injured. It happened on our watch. We're going to take care of you. And so the folks who were going to Walter Reed for treatment at first were on a one-year cycle, and it had to be renewed. Right, understand we're here in DC, you, or those of you who have uh, worked for the federal government, right? somebody's gotta pay for something. And, and I, I always learned this fascinated from government agency to agency, right? It's not one big government. This agency has a budget and that agency has a budget. And if this agency does work, they want that agency to pay for it, not this agency out of their budget. So it, it has been an issue of who pays for the treatment at Walter Reed. and. The CIA stopped renewing people uh, because their medical services offices was, was getting involved in trying to contradict what the Pentagon and the folks at Walter Reed were saying. And then to its credit, the Pentagon said, to hell with it. Anybody who's been at our program, you're going to stay. You keep making your appointments. We don't care. We'll figure out the money later. So DOD right now is, is the, the better is the kind of poster child for how to deal with things at the moment. I um, mean, we'll see, but it, it's a big bureaucracy, and there are a lot of problems, and there's a lot of people fighting against what's happening. And it takes people to step up uh, and do the right thing, which we're seeing by a lot of people on the Hill, thankfully, uh, and, and people within each of the agencies. So, Andrew, I, you know, I, I, many moons ago, when I was in Iraq, um, I met a special forces officer named Chris Miller who ended up being the acting assistant secretary, uh, acting secretary of defense in, in, in the last administration. I met and him for- And my client. And your client. Um, that's, <laughs> and, and I met him for a beer at the VNN, which lots of people here know about, a famous old uh, agency hangout. And so as uh, acting secretary of defense, uh, uh, and it, it was just after he left, Chris said with no hesitation, I absolutely believe this occurred. Um, DOD was committed to investigating this. Uh, there were special forces officers that he knew who were affected by this. Um, he was as clear as can be in, in that statement. And one other thing I'll add, you know, at the end of this is, you know, Walter Reed is a, is a U.S. military facility institution. 
And they're the doctors who diagnosed me with a traumatic brain injury, um, who said that you know, uh, testing and imaging showed something had occurred to me, and this was not a pre-existing condition. Um, three things that the agency would never even go close to, to uh, 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 you know, providing me. Um, so I, you know, I think I, I, it, it, for a lot of the victims, I think we have a lot more faith uh, in, in the DOD system on this. And I think a lot of it does have to do with what, what Mark alluded to, is that they have had experience over the years um, in strange kinds of medical issues, um, which, which frankly all end up being real in the end. What did that feel like, Mark, when you heard that, when you heard that you, you know, you, when, when you felt like you weren't being gassed sure. any longer, when you, your suffering was validated? It's, you know, it was, a, it was a, a, a tremendous moment when I, when I was discharged from Walter Reed and I had that piece of paper in my hand. And even recently when they provided more kind of documentation um, for some of my, my compensation claims uh, to the agency. But this is, this is a, a tangible piece of paper um, written by a, uh, uh, you know, a, a team at Walter Reed who have for decades studied traumatic brain injury. We saw after two you know, uh, 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 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan the tremendous toll um, uh, TBI and post-traumatic stress and others took on our, uh, uh, on our U.S. military personnel. Um, the fact that they provided this to me, I had tears in my eyes. I finally had something tangible. I held that paper in my hand. It was an extraordinary moment. And um, I will, you know, and, and going back and, and seeing and talking to the doctors there, uh, they deserve a, a, a great deal of credit uh, in my view because um, they also knew the entire time I was there that they were going up against uh, the CIA's Office of Medical Services. And again, this is a painful thing for me to talk about. This is my, this is my, my people a place I deeply believe in. When you, just one thing for, for folks here, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, perhaps current um, or definitely former agency folks in, in the audience. Um, you don't join the CIA as a nine to five job. Um, this becomes part of your identity. You go through case officer training, operational training. Um, it is your life. It, and, and maybe that's a bad thing. And, you know, we can kind of go over, uh, uh, you know, work-life balance, which there's not much of. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, the idea that CIA's doctors were actively working against me, um, that is anathema. That's against everything that, that I truly believed in the institution. Meanwhile, DOD's doctors uh, uh, at the time and still do believe in me, and that's pretty extraordinary, and that's a credit to, 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 to Walter Reed for sure. Mm -hmm. And here's a related question. Have there been any follow-up MRIs that show improvement within the brain tissue and thus can extrapolate backwards to definitively document brain injury or damage? Not, not that I've seen a published study on. I, I assume individual cases will have been rescanned, probably, but those would be covered by HIPAA, I would imagine. I've had a lot of MRIs <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Um, you know, I think that, it, and, and I think there's some, some uh, uh, you know, folks in the audience who are, who are very well versed on this, but it, there, you know, it's not always entirely clear what's going to come out on, on imaging. Um, and I don't think we should put, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot into that other than if doctors see anomalies, that's, that's important. I think there's, you know, for me and for some of the other patients, it's, uh, you know, improvement is how you feel every day. Do you wake up with vertigo? Do you wake up with a headache? Um, I will tell you, I've had it, you know, since December 5th, 2017, I've had a headache every day. That's five years. It has never gone away. It caused me certainly a lot of pain in the past. I, you know, there's, it, it's, it's amazing that I'm sitting here today. Um, the, the tendency to self-medicate for this is extreme. You know, nothing like having two or three scotches at night or four doesn't hurt anymore. That's not very healthy. Um, That's a CIA thing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, but ultimately, you know, when, when you start feeling better, you know you're feeling better. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, that's the improvement that, that I wanted to see. And, it, and it's a lot that was taught at a lot of these facilities in terms of, you know, kind of overall wellness and resiliency. Things like sleep patterns, what you eat. Um, there's a pharmaceutical option for a lot of people. You know, for me, it, that, that didn't work, but you know, like the softer side of healing, a lot of therapy. Um, uh, uh, you know, they know how to treat, the doctors there and, and, and other facilities who know how to treat traumatic brain injury, know how to treat this um, from decades of experience uh, in, in the war zone. So uh, that's how I knew I was improving from, from just generally getting up every day and saying, you know what, today might not be such a bad day. Four scotches is also how I got, get my daughter to sleep sometimes at night. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, next question. Given that we have both the resources and the technology, 
Why have we not installed detection equipment at our embassies overseas to prevent more officers from getting sick? They started giving detectors quite soon uh, after the first alleged Havana incident. The, the problem with a detector in terms of what's unclassified is that what you're talking about is an RF frequency meter which kind of picks up almost anything, right? I'm sort of looking at the two people who've had classified clearance. I don't know what the, the actual state of, of detection and countermeasures is on this. Um, but there, as far as I know, haven't been, isn't a perfect detector for, for what this kind of thing could be. Yeah, it's complicated, uh, obviously. Uh, I guess what I would say, in sort of going back to what Nikki was talking about with, it is amazing what information is out there publicly in patent applications and government contracts of how long the industries have been working on this. And I know what I had been told uh, from inside is that, frankly, our adversaries are way ahead of us. And some of it was because people just made decisions to where they were going to focus on work, what was the applicability of it. Uh, others because some countries have lower ethical medical standards than we do as far as testing out certain techniques and devices and, and things like that. One of the things that, that I found fascinating, going back to the history, uh, I had some connections with some old timers in the, in the agency, separate and apart from this, and uh, in their belongings, when this one guy's dad had passed away, who had been in the agency in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, he found these Kodachrome slides, right? Remember old Kodachrome slides? Um, among his dad's possessions, and sent them to me because he knew that I was working on, on these issues. And you can't tell if this is about weaponry. You can't tell if it's about surveillance. You can't tell even if it's the US doing it to the adversary or the adversary doing it to the US. But it's these car, I don't know, car animated images of one building to the next of beaming microwaves from one to the next or radio frequency to one to the next. And then a whole bunch of words and symbols that I have never understood other than it said station in one of them, which is a lexicon for many of people will know in this audience. Uh, and these slides are from 1971. Uh, so there's been a lot going on that we know behind the scenes, especially the Defense Department, current applicability uh, that they've been studying. So uh, there are answers to those questions, but probably just too complicated to do here. Andrew, I'll, I'll throw just one thing in here. It's using an old kind of term we use in the counterterrorism world. It's called getting off the X. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, that certainly has been passed, um, uh, you know, through the, you know current agency uh, staff is if you're feeling something, like what we are hearing in terms of sound or or any kind of blast wave, is is to is to you know get all, get away from that location. Um, one of the things our doctors have told us at, at Walter Reed and other places is the more exposure you ha you have had to whatever happened. The, the you know the the more kind of the severity of your injury increases and so it's the idea of of again getting off the X someone's not shooting an AK-47 at you but someone's doing something to you and and you know for me just on a personal note as I've been very public about this and and again I've I've note, noted how difficult it is but you know the times where I realized you know perhaps this was worth it um, was when three or four officers uh, who were injured overseas and th these are again some of the cases which I have absolutely no doubt. Um, uh, uh, what occurred to them. They said that they, they absolutely thought of that article in GQ um, uh, where I went public with this, and they thought immediately, I got to get off the X. And, that, and they attribute that to, um, to being able to recover more quickly. Uh, so, so at the end of the day, I mean, you think about, you know, what, what are countermeasures? It's if you feel something, kind of, you know, you know, get, you know move, move, that, move out of that location a, a, as quickly as possible. And that, that to me is... Uh, is probably the only thing um, in terms of advice rather than any kind of technical, uh, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, thing you're wearing, a body-worn device or, or mm. something in your apartment. There's been, a, there's been, people have tried that. I mean, there's, there's been a whole bunch of officers who have had things um, to try to detect some kind of, uh, uh, you know, microwave blast or something. That just, to me, that hasn't worked.
Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I will add, there is evidence, and by when I say evidence as a lawyer, it doesn't mean it's good evidence, but there is evidence <laughs> of, from technology, cell phones and computers, of at the same time the human is feeling something, the cell phones were going crazy and the computers were going crazy. This goes to what I was saying earlier of where my anger and frustration grows is to trying to understand what's going on on the inside as far as studying this. Because I know I have clients who have this evidence and we've offered it to the government many times and either they don't take it or they take it and then we never, it just goes into you know, uh, Indiana Jones vault at the end of uh, the first movie and just disappears. Well, I've, I've been informed that we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Uh, it's been such a great conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, gentlemen. Uh, I think it would be good to close out with you, Nicky, because sure. we came here uh, because of this fantastic podcast, which is casting a light on this important issue. So I just wondered if you could tell us uh, a little bit more about the next venture. I know that you guys are working on <laughs> something else intelligence related, which oh I think is God. quite well, interesting. So me and, me and Max have made a rule that we're not talking about the next season until after this okay. one is done. It has been, after the, they, sh they shot down that Chinese spy balloon and I uh, passed the commissioner was immediately like, we're doing UFOs next. And I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> So, uh, so, but yeah, not sure yet. So, so dealing with the intelligence community, uh, how has that experience <laughs> been for you? <laughs> I mean, so I've done national security reporting when I was at the Guardian, and um, a lot of that was about the interface between local police departments and national security, and that was also a um, similar experience to, to you've spent your whole career kind of trying to twist Freedom of Information Act answers out of... We, we had that same... You, you find yourself running up against the impetus of just don't talk about it, just don't, especially not to press, but in, in general, to sort of leave it, allow it to be classified, bank it, put it in the end in Andrew Jones, Jones' vault. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's obviously, you know, hugely an, an important kind of area, but it is a, a frustrating reporting experience to be reporting on these agencies that instinctively don't like exposing things to sunlight. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, could you all put your hands together to thank our panel, please?